This morning our lesson comes from what Brother Dan just read a moment ago, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, looking at what I call the devil's three goals. You think about it, of course, I think you can probably look at a lot of different goals in which the devil has in mind for us. But I think about, for instance, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, where the Bible says, Lest Satan should, should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know that Satan has a lot of ways in which he can reach us, a lot of ways in which he can distract us, a lot of ways, a lot of things he can do to make us basically just disinterested in God, the church, and the Bible in general. And it's interesting that Paul, all those years ago, says the same thing in verse 11. He says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of the tools in which he uses to try to pull us away from God or even to keep us away from God. We notice in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 13, how Paul mentions what we know many times as the, the armor of a Christian. When he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I think about that phrase in verse 11. He says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That tells me that without the armor of God, we cannot stand against the wiles of the devil. That is, we cannot stand against his tools, his his power, his deceiving, and all those types of things, unless we are covered in the armor of God. You notice there in verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. If we have to put on the armor of God to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, then that tells us that we do not put on the armor of God, then we will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Where one is true, the opposite also is true. Verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. He's saying that it's more than just physical things. He says, sure, we're going to come in contact, of course, with those who are physical, those who are going to be against us, he says there. But notice his focus in, this, in these verses is not the physical. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But that, you might say things are much more powerful, things are much more wicked. He says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. You notice there it's all in plurality, isn't it? I mean, there's more than one. There's more than one principality. There's more than one power. There's more than one ruler of the darkness of this age. He says, against spiritual hosts, that is plural again, of wickedness, and the heavenly places. He's saying against all the various evils that are in the world, we better make sure we have on the armor of God. Because if we do not, as we saw there in verse 11, we will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Again, where the one is true, the opposite also is true. If we do not take up the whole armor of God, you will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It's amazing to me today, people ask so many times, I've heard it all over different places, I can't understand why so-and-so isn't doing, the right, doing what they're supposed to be doing or doing what is right. It doesn't matter how young, how old, or male or female, yet people ask the same questions. Well, they're not following God, they're not going to do what is right. It's not really that complicated, to be honest, is it? If you're not doing what the Bible says, if you're not even having God as a priority in your life, then why should we be surprised that people today are not following God as He should? Verse 13 says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. There are those who, as we'll talk about a little bit later, who think will try to justify just a little bit of sin in their life. It's okay to do some sinful activities. But you notice there in verse 13 he says, That we may be able to withstand in the evil day, the day when we have temptations and we were at our point of deciding, what are we going to do? Are we going to follow God? Are we just going to say, forget it? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Because we make that decision, we're making a heaven or hell decision, aren't we? Because if we choose to follow God and follow Him obediently, we're going to have heaven. If we choose anything else, it's not going to be going to heaven, is it? Because we cannot be so selfish and say that I'm going to do what I want to do, then be blown away, surprised, on the day of judgment, Christ looks at us and says, I never knew you. 
You see, things get very real when we think about it in that type of way. Because we are all for God and we're going to be against Him. And so in verse 13 he says, That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. To do all we can to withstand temptation. Verse 13. Excuse me, verse... Uh, Yes, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. You know, these are all things we're supposed to be doing. These are all actions. Watch means you is an action, literally watching out what you're doing. Watching, considering your life and how you're living, how you're talking, how you're speaking, what's important, all those types of things. Stand fast in the faith, that also is an action. Because we don't stand fast in the faith, we're going to fall from faith. And so that too is an action, isn't it? He says, be brave. That is an action. Brave is a characteristic of a Christian, but also it's an action. That is, we're constantly being brave and doing what is right. Because it takes a brave person, doesn't it, to be faithful to God. It takes a brave person to tell their friends or co-workers, even family members, to say, and just look at them and say, no... God wants us to do this or wants me to do this because his body, the Word of God tells me that. And so I'm going to do that. That takes bravery, doesn't it? It takes courage. Verse, six, verse 13 goes on to say, be strong. Again, that's an action. Continual strength to, to do what? To be watchful, to stand fast in, the, in faith and be brave. It takes strength to do all those things. And so all of those are actions and continual actions that a Christian must possess. We think about three goals in which the devil has for us. Now, we could have 30,000 different goals that the devil has for us. We're going to boil it down to three this morning. And the first one, I think, is pretty simple. He wants to render you worthless in the church. He wants you to be the person who doesn't do anything. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you, if you are rendered worthless, that is, you don't do anything, you don't really are convicted about your faith, then you're not really that concerned about doing what is right, are you? You see how, where we're going? He wants also to keep you barren. Notice John 15 and verse 2. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You ever heard the phrase, practice makes perfect? When reality is perfect, practice makes perfect, doesn't it? But we keep doing things, what happens? We get better at it. We keep talking to those who we need to talk to and visiting with them and, and maybe adjusting our approach where we need to, but always bringing the truth. And what happens? We improve over time, don't we? And as we begin to maybe bring one person to a Bible study, maybe over time we begin, begin to bring more. That's the idea we find there in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he pre-prunes that, that it may bear more fruit. If you want to see what someone get excited about Christ, see someone who's just said their first Bible study with someone about the Bible, about the church in general. Someone who's just sat down and talked with someone about Christ and salvation for more than just a few moments. You're going to see someone who's going to probably go right back out and start looking for someone else to talk to as well because they want to keep doing that. You ever heard the phrase many times in reference to those who are newly converted, how a person is on fire for Christ? And what I mean by that basically is that they are excited about about being a Christian. They're excited about learning more about God and the Bible. Are we still on fire for Christ today? Some of us have been Christians for a long time. Some of us less than others. But, you know, it shouldn't change from day to day, should it? Notice John 15, verse 8. He says, By this my Father is glorified. By what? By those who are bearing much fruit. He said that you may bear, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Disciples there literally being learners. If you are bearing fruit and reaching out to those around you, you're being the disciple of Christ. It's interesting so many times that you'll notice that Christ never talks about someone is going to be fruitful just because they bring someone to Christ. What I mean by that is, it's not about numbers, is it? Because we can talk to someone about the Bible, and then someone else come along and talk to them about the Bible, and three weeks later someone else comes along and talks to them, and what happens is they set up a study. You see, one kind of begins to water, and someone else 
is actually able to take benefit of what has happened previously. We may not always be the one who's there when that soul is converted, but we can start the process or we can keep the process going and keeping the interest in someone's mind so that one day they may decide to study and to become a follower of Christ. But how does Satan want to render you worthless in the church? Well, the first one is pretty easy. He wants to keep you ignorant of your duty. There are some today who'd say that the Great Commission is not to the Christians of today. That it was, in fact, they really created a, a new limited commission, say it was only to those men in which Christ was talking to on that day, to them only. You know what, what I think of when I hear that? That's someone who doesn't care very much about souls. I think about a person who's pretty lazy. You're going to say the Great Commission does apply to us? How can a Christian honestly sit there and look at you and say, well, that doesn't apply to me? How does it not apply to us? Do we, do we want to be in heaven alone? Because if that's our attitude, we're going to have a whole different problem with the day of judgment, won't we? It applies to all mankind. It applies to all Christians. But he wants you to be ignorant of your duty. He wants you to be covetous. That is, he wants us to be more concerned about ourselves, you might say. You could use the word selfish there. That goes right to our next point. He wants you to be too busy. We got too much stuff going on. I understand each, most of, many of us still work, some do not. But you know, we always find time for things that we really want to do. Do we find time for things we really need to do for Christ and the church? We could write down a whole long list of reasons we hear people say, why well, they can't do something. And then they find plenty of reasons and plenty of time for something else they enjoy. Do we not care about souls around us? Do we not care about those in our community? Do we not care about those throughout the world we can reach? We need to make sure we do care and stop being so selfish. And again, our last one is excuses. We can think of anything. Any reason for not doing as we should. Satan wants to render you completely worthless in the church. He wants you to be bored. He wants you to be tired. He wants you to be busy. He wants you to find excuses to do anything to keep you from doing what Christ has commanded us to do. That is to talk to those and reach out to those around us. What's something else that Satan wants to do? Another goal that he has for you? He wants to keep you out of the church. I kind of made a progression with this. He wants you to be worthless because if you're worthless in the church, you're probably not going to be in the church very long. And so now he wants to keep you out of the church. Because once you start missing, it becomes easier to miss, doesn't it? It becomes more tempting to miss. It becomes more tempting to stay out of some activity you could be involved in. It becomes easier. It's like a snowball. The more you roll it, what happens? It gets bigger and bigger. Well, the same way it happens with not doing what we should. It gets worse. And the problem gets bigger and bigger. Well, what's easier to solve, a big problem or a small one? The small one. So he wants to keep you out of the church. Well, notice this, first of all. We need, to, we need to remember the benefits of being in the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. Here the Bible says, Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We know, first of all, the first benefit of being in the church is you're one of the what? Saved. That's the greatest benefit of all. But does it seem to you sometimes that for some people that's not enough? They think they've done their part. It's kind of like a, a time card at a business. They walk in, they punch it, and they walk out, and they punch it again. I've done my part. I've done what I'm supposed to do. But look what Paul, or look here what Luke reminds us of in Acts 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. What were those who were in the church being saved doing? They were praising God. It's interesting that even many times back here we find that even God's people still find favor in the sight of God or in the side of their sight. 
Because they were what? They were honest people. A Christian is an honest person, a good person, a moral person, a kind person, a generous person. On and on it goes. Is there any reason why they wouldn't find favor with all the people? A Christian, a true, honest Christian is the best friend you could possibly have. That's why they found favor inside the people. But notice also, what's one of the benefits of being the church? I pointed out just a moment ago, being one of the saved. Being saved and staying saved should be enough to keep us motivated to care about God and the church. And to care about pleasing God. The blood of Christ was shed for our sins. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You know, too many times we're not faced by the idea of Christ shedding His blood on the cross, are we? We've heard it too many times. It doesn't mean much to us anymore. The man, the, the Son of God, dying on the cross, shedding His blood for many, that is, those who be obedient, it doesn't faze people anymore. Because they deem Christianity, being, they deem being a Christian way too demanding. I mean, I can't do this or shouldn't do this. You know, too many times I've heard people say, we shouldn't view Christianity as a list of do's and don'ts. We should view it as doing things that please God and sending from those things that don't please God. And so for that reason, we know we don't view it as do's and don'ts. We view that God doesn't want me to do this. It's not pleasing to Him. It's sin. And so therefore, I won't do that. And so it's no longer a system of do's and don'ts, but it's a system of, it's not going to please God. I'm not going to do it. I'm not even going to think about doing it. Notice Hebrews 9, verse 22. And here the Bible says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding blood there is no remission. What had to be shed? Blood had to be shed for our sins. Who shed His blood? Christ did. There are benefits of being the church, and it begins with the shedding of the blood of Christ. You look at Ephesians 1, verse 3, the Bible tells us specifically that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. And you hear people outside, people who have fallen away, say, well, I don't think God hears my prayers anymore. <coughs> and when's the last time you repented of your sin and, and actually started doing what is right? Well, they don't want to talk about that. No, because the fault is always on Christ. It's always on God. Kind of like our whole society isn't someone else's fault, right? Well, Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, The spiritual blessings are in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ, you could add, we're not going to, but you could add the word alone. In Christ alone are spiritual blessings. Because that's true, isn't it? He doesn't say in Christ and in Muhammad and in Allah and in yourselves. He says, no, it's in Christ. We must remember benefits received in the church. What is the mission of the church? Notice Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Ephesians 3 and verse 10 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to what? To everybody else. It falls upon the church, it falls upon the saved to reach out to the lost. He says there to the principalities and powers and heavenly places. He, that could be a reference there to those simply who are in position of authority. Those who are, you know, the leaders. You know why leaders today get so corrupt? Because Christians don't speak up enough. We're not that squeaky wheel. You've heard the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We're not squeaking very much. We sit by, we complain. And yet we still have those who complain. They don't even go and vote. They still, they still complain. We don't do enough to let others know that, hey, we're still here. And we're still in disagreement. In Ephesians 3 verse 10 says, Might be made known by the church, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Another mission of the church, as we mentioned a moment ago, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 through 20, the Great Commission. 
Now notice what Christ says. If Jesus came and spoke to them, verse, 19, verse 18, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Christ has all authority. That's why he can say what he's about to say in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Why were these words even recorded if they weren't for us? That's a good question, isn't it? But they were recorded. Why? So that we would know what Christ wants us today still to do. Still to go out to all the world, he says there in verse 19. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, rather, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, all the teachings of Christ. How could we possibly say, well, that's not for me? Doesn't that sound so selfish? That's not my duty to do that. That was their job. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We, too, must abide and follow the great commission given by Christ. Was he speaking to his disciples? Yes. Does that make it not apply to us? No. It still applies to us today. Because we can still do that very same thing, can't we? We are to care and to be concerned about the lost. And that is another part of the mission of the church. James 1 verse 27 tells us another part is to care about those who are ill. James 1 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To do what? To help those who are in troublesome times. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he's talking about, isn't it? He says to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We are to be there for those who are struggling. We are to be there for those who are going through difficult times. We know that we are to care for those among us, but also we should care for those outside the church as well. You know, one of the reasons we have a food pantry so that our community knows that we care about you and want to make sure you have at least something to eat. We want to help you in the way that we can. And we don't just do that physically on that Saturday, do we? No, we also take care of it spiritually. We try to teach them and encourage them to follow God. That is what a Christian does, and that's what the church does. Why does Satan want to keep you out of the church? Well, look at the benefits of the church. Look at the mission of the church. And also notice what else happens in the church. God is glorified in the church. Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, why does Satan want you out of the church? Because he doesn't want you praying to God. He doesn't want you bringing your concerns, your cares, your worries before God. He wants you out of the church. Because why? Paul mentions here why in verse 20. Now to him, that is who? He can be referencing God, he can be referencing Christ. Who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. Exceedingly abundantly. That sounds like confidence, doesn't it? God can do above everything that we ask, he says in verse 20. Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. What is that? You could we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. You could talk about the power of love that we have for God, our faithfulness. And because we have faith in God, He answers our prayers. And because we follow Him, He answers our prayers in accordance to His will. We've talked about that many times before. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You see why Satan wants you out of the church? He doesn't want you anywhere near that. He doesn't want you to have that resource that is God. Notice also Colossians 3 and verse 17. Here the Bible says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to who? To God. For everything that He has done for us and continues to do for us. 
We looked at benefits of receiving the church. We looked at mission of the church. And that shouldn't be up there now. But we looked at how God, we glorify God within the church as well. How does, how does Satan keep people out of the church? By prejudice? For various reasons. It doesn't have to be because of someone's skin. It could, it could be because of what someone makes. It could be because, could be because of someone's age. You know that? Timothy dealt with that. The only thing Paul said that no one despised your youth, Timothy, would be an example. Prejudice. Another phrase we hear, one church is as good as another. That's the biggest law of man has ever made up. Or one of them, I should say. I don't know which one you could say the biggest is. But one church is as good as another. Is that, could that be any further from the truth? Because how many churches will lead a person down the, through the Word of God and actually show them the path to eternal life? Only one. So is one church as good as another? No. If one church is focused on entertainment, that's not as good as the Bible following church, is it? If one church is focused upon social, you know, socializing and, and getting clicks together, having, having their kids have a good time in entertainment, all those types of things, that's not as good as another, is it? Because you have the social church, you have the fun church, you have the do-what-you-please congregation, whatever you want to think of, but they're not the ones who are going to lead you to heaven, are they? There's only one church that Christ purchased with His own blood. It's the one He built. It's the one that's found upon the, His Word and His commands. And that one only leads a person to heaven. So one church cannot be good as good as another. Jesus and not the church. That's a lot of people like to hear. They say, organized religion scares me. You know what scares me? Those who think they don't have or think they can follow Christ without organized religion. Because the church is organized, isn't it? Paul tells us, whatever you, whatever you do, we are to do decently and in order. One of the reasons the church is in the shape it is because people today don't know what decently in order is. They do what they please. They just change worship altogether. And they say, well, give us Jesus. Talk to us about Jesus, but keep the church out of it. For Andrew, you can't get into heaven unless you're in the church, can you? They don't want to hear about the idea of being obedient and following and, and being submissive to elders or repentance or about the one true church. Boy, that will start a firestorm. But there's only one, isn't there? Jesus and not the church. Another lie we find that Satan uses to pull us away from the church. Faith only saves. That's pretty self-explanatory. There are those who say that all you have to do is just have faith in God and you'll be okay. No, you won't. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us the person who what, endures to the end shall be saved. Not the one who is faith only is all you need. You remember the words we read so many times in Revelation 2 and verse 10? Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. That doesn't sound like faith only, does it? Or once, or once saved, always saved. That sounds like a faith that endures until Christ comes back or until that heart in our chest stops beating. We are faithful to the very, very end. Baptism is not necessary. There's another way that Satan tries to pull you out of church. You don't have to be baptized. Grandma wasn't baptized. Grandpa wasn't baptized. Does it matter what grandpa, grandma, what mother, daddy did if it's different than what the Bible says? You know, I have family members who have deceased, who were not baptized or mission of sins. That doesn't change what the Bible says, does it? I wish it was different. I wish they had done differently. Make sure that sounds correct. Not that the Bible was there. I wish what they did was different. But it's not. It doesn't change what the Bible says, does it? Baptism has always been essential in the New Testament time, on the New Testament law, and it always will be essential. When they asked Peter in Acts 2, in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, what? Repent, and you'll be fine. No. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Others still want to say that baptism is a sprinkling or pouring is acceptable, though you won't find any instance anywhere in the Bible that ever occurred. 
Because everyone who's ever baptized was immersed because that's what it meant. If you were to take Philip out and say, hey, we're going to baptize you, you took a pitcher of water and put it over his head, he's saying, what are you doing? You're not baptizing me. That's not immersing me. It was immersion and only immersion. The reason we have those who have come up with sprinkling and pouring is because many times what we call deathbed confessions. And what they would do, they'd take water and they'd pour water over a person until they are just drenched and inside that person was now baptized. That's not baptism, is it? There's only one form of baptism, and it's immersion. And the last one's pretty simple, procrastination. How does Satan want to keep you in the church? Just put it off. you got plenty of time. Uh, isn't that what Felix told Paul? Go away for now and have a more convenient time. I'll call for you, but he never called for Paul again. In fact, he left Paul in prison as a favor to the Jews. Procrastination. What else does Satan want to do? His third goal Get you back into the world. Completely get you all the way back in the world where you never think about church again. How many of us know those who, when they were younger, were faithful? I know of individuals who were faithful. They, were, they went to Bible camps every summer. They loved it. They were at services every time. They were trying to do what was right. And as they got older, they departed from the faith and went right back in the world. Now they don't have anything to do with it. There are those who lost loved ones, lost family members, lost, lost friends, and use that as a reason to be angry with God, as if God killed their loved one, their friend, or allowed them to die. Not because life is hard, or because persons make poor decisions, or because we have free will. Instead, they blame God and they go back into the world. Notice 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. We know that Demas went back. The Bible says, For Demas has forsaken me, this being Paul speaking, <clears throat> For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Grecians for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. Demas has forsaken me, what? Having loved this present world. Paul, if he's talking about this present world, all he knows there's another world, is, doesn't he? The world of all this never ends, eternity, with God and Christ. But he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. This world has a lot of things to offer, <coughs> but one of them isn't eternal life. But we find here that Demas went back into the world. We find that we are told not to love the world, James 4, verse 3. You ask and not receive because you ask and miss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. We ask for things, we pray for things because sometimes we're selfish and we do things that are not pleasing the sight of God or want to do things that are not pleasing the sight of God. 1 John 2 and verse 15. <clears throat> here the Bible... Well, I must not put it on here. How he works. No harm in sinful activities. Or in some sinful activities. There are those who say, well, just a little bit. You know, it's like, a, you know, we say, well, just a little bit won't hurt you. Is that right? You know, we use the argument, we use the argument for alcohol all the time. Well, just a little bit won't hurt you, though. You have study after study that says it does. After the first drink, it starts messing with your senses and your judgments and those types of things. But we ignore all that. A lot of people do. Just a little bit of sin. Let them go to prom just one time. It won't be that bad. A young girl who went to Bible, who was in Bible camp where I was at several years ago. And others as well, not just her others, they start posting pictures of prom. And what do you see? Well, you don't stop and look because you see immodesty. You see pictures of, of them dancing in ways that no one should be dancing until they're with their spouse alone. All kinds of things that go on. And we wonder why people today can't be faithful because we say, well, just a little bit of sin's okay. No, it's not. You remember Paul says a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. You get it started, it's going to be hard to let it get it to stop. No harm in some sinful activities. Pleasure of the world in Christianity. That's why we have people today bringing things into the church, don't we? That's why we have places now that they have to have a gymnasium to get people to come to services. 
They had to have that coffee shop in their church buildings. There's not one, there's one not near, not very far from us. He's already been talking about it. Once they get it built, they have the funds. Boy, we're going to put that right in. We'll have a game room and everything else. The world coming right into the church, isn't it? The world has no place coming to the church. The church has to go into the world and to change the way our world is living and acting and thinking. We can close with this point, at least, with this final verse. Evil companions. Too many times we think someone's a good person. We just, we just hang around them for years. They do sinful things. They talk in ways they shouldn't be talking. They use foul language, cruel jokes. They spend time with those the opposite sex in ways they shouldn't encourage their friends to do the same thing. When are we going to learn that those who are doing sinful things should be around us? If you have a choice, get away from them. We have to learn from those types of things. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. We have to get away from those who are not any good for us. We have to change the way we think and decide what is most important because if we don't, God's going to see what's already most important in our lives, isn't He? As we close this morning, we have to remember that Satan is crafty and he no doubt can ruin you if you allow him to do so. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, it's that phrase I didn't look at earlier. I want to save it for this, for this final part. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. Those who say, well, just a little bit of sin, he's going to jump all over that. Those who say, well, this person really isn't that bad, he's going to jump all over that. Going here, doing this, talking this way around these people, he's going to jump all over that. He will take advantage of you wherever he can. You think about it, if you will, for a moment in a military sense. If you have a weak spot, where do you think your opponent, your enemy, is going to attack? That weak spot. Because that's what an enemy does, a smart enemy does. They find the weakest point, and they try to make it larger, and then they just go from there. Satan's doing the same thing. Where is your weak spot? And he's going to jump all over it. We have to be aware of the tools of Satan. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 reminds us that we can overcome him. Here the Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you such as common to man. You're not going through anything that someone else hasn't already gone through before. We think we have it hard. Look at some of those guys in the Bible. And how they're being... Paul was in prison most of his time for being a Christian. He said most of his life as a Christian in behind bars, and he still did what? He still wrote letters. He still did what he all he could for Christ. But he was in prison. We don't have it as bad as we think we do, but it's going to get worse. We don't have it nice. We don't have it easy. It's only going to get worse. You look around the world, we know that Christians and our leaders, even leaders here at home, hate those who are trying to follow Christ. They hate the Bible. But notice, go back to verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you such, such as common to man, but God is faithful. That means He's always there, isn't it? means He's always present, He's always listening, He's always there ready and willing to help you when we come to Him and do that which is right. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That means God is going to allow you to find a way, as we'll see in a moment, to get out of this temptation, to overcome it. Verse 13, He says, But with the, but with the temptation... Will also make the way with escape that you may be able to bear. That means by God being with you, verse 13, He's going to show you a way to overcome it, isn't He? And sometimes, friends, it's just patience. We forget sometimes we just have to endure things. Some things won't last forever. We have to be patient and before we know that has passed and we have endured through whatever that temptation has been, that hardship, that persecution. But we cannot be unfaithful to God and expect Him to carry us through when we will not cling to Him. 
This morning, as you think about these things, we know that Satan, he has many goals for us. He has a lot of things in mind for us. We must decide if we're going to follow God and overcome Satan and be pleasing the sight of God, if we're just going to put a white flag and say, I just don't care anymore. Because there are some today who are already doing that. And when we do that, Satan's already won, hasn't he? We better make sure that if we're not living our life that's right, that we make it right while we still have time. This morning, as you think about these things, if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to do so. I believe all those who are here who are of age are. If you are a Christian, we know sometimes we do make mistakes. We allow things to tempt us and to harm us and to creep into our lives. But we can, re we can remove those things or make ourselves right with God. This morning, if you have any needs or concerns, you come forward. That's going to be saying, singing the song that's been selected.